Hey everyone, my name is Seth Adams and uh, I'm one of the co-chairs along with Mark Thompson, a thousand friends of Martinez. Um, Mark uh, is letting people in as they come in and uh, uh, we appreciate you attending. Thousand Friends of Martinez is a political action committee um, that was formed to help uh, elect better um, uh, city council, school board members, et cetera, um, and to work on basically three different things conservation in the Martinez area, quality of life issues, and good government issues. Um, we've uh, endorsed candidates for three election cycles now, and we um, can still say that every candidate that we have endorsed has been elected. That's, uh, that's uh, I'm not sure that'll continue forever, but we've been uh, pretty lucky so far. Um, we uh, do a number of things. Um, uh, we, we, Rec make recommendations to park agencies about um, acquisitions of various projects. Uh, we do various kinds of stewardship things. Um, uh, we lead tours to educate the public. Most importantly, we respond to a lot of land use and other kinds of, of projects uh, at the city and at other various government agencies. Um, and we try to educate the public by holding these kinds of public meetings, candidate forums, um, and uh, and uh, by putting out regular e-blasts uh, to let people know about various things. So this is our regular quarterly or seasonal meeting. Um, we've got Colin Coffey from East Bay Regional Park District who's going to be speaking um, in a couple of minutes. Um, and I just wanted to point out um, some of our uh, um, steering committee members, uh, Mark Thompson, Tim Platt, Kay Cox, Harlan Strickland, um, uh, Dan Barrows, and I thought I saw Linda in the, in the audience there. Um, uh, at, we're gonna have Colin speak for about 20 minutes, um, and then uh, we're gonna have up to 10 minutes for questions. Um, we may uh, open up the mics then. In general, please um, mute your mic right now. We're using kind of a, a simple version of Zoom, so, so uh, we'll, we'll depend on you to mute your own uh, uh, Mike for now, and uh, when we get to the question part, we'll, um, we'll open that up. So um, I'm going to introduce Colin Coffey now. Uh, he's the Ward 7 board member for East Bay Regional Park District, which is a two-county special district, uh, including Contra Costa and Alameda counties. Um, he's also vice president of the board of East Bay Regional Park District. He lives in Hercules. Um, his ward stretches from uh, Western Contra Costa, all the way across the northern waterfront um, to uh, Antioch and Brentwood and down to the county line uh, in Byron. He, uh, he was appointed to the board in January 2017. Previously, he served on the Park District Park Advisory Committee twice. Uh, he was appointed by Ted Radke at one point and by the board, County Board of Supervisors at another. He's been a volunteer ambassador for the parks for 12 years. He's a longtime supporter of John Muir Land Trust a member of the Regional Parks Association. Uh, his profession is that he's a partner at the firm Best Best in Krieger and Walnut Creek and a public health attorney representing public and nonprofit health care providers. He's past president of the Contra Costa Bar Association, uh, married, has two children, um, and he's a lifelong resident of Contra Costa County and has been involved in Contra Costa politics his entire life. Uh, I, I mentioned the Northern Waterfront that he represents um, in the Martinez area, the parks in his ward include uh, parts of Briones, Martinez Strait Shoreline, Crockett Hills, Radke Martinez Shoreline, and Waterbird Preserve McNabney Marsh. Uh, regional trails crossing Martinez include the Contra Costa Canal Trail, the Iron Horse Trail, the SF Bay Trail, and the Bay Area Ridge Trail. Um, he has a, obviously a variety of other regional parks in Ward 7 crossing the, the northern waterfront from uh, San Pablo Bay to um, uh, Vasco Caves and, and so on. Uh, but we're, we're asking him to tell us more about the state of the park district right now um, and a, with a, a focus on Martinez. So Colin Coffey, thank you very much. I know you have a PowerPoint, so we're gonna um, uh, flip over to you so that you can share that and um, get started. Oh, thank you, Seth. I, you know, and if you want to know a little about my politics, all you need to know is that uh, I grew up uh, with uh, Senator Miller as my godfather. And uh, 
the, the congressman as a close uh, family friend. So uh, my political world has been in the orbit of the George Miller family uh, for uh, 40 plus years. <laughs> and and uh, obviously kept me uh, pretty well in touch with uh, Martinez politics at, at, at that. So let me pull this up. Give me a moment or two. Move some stuff out of the way. And all right, I need to switch screens. And so Seth, is that showing up? Yes, great. Good. Yes. <laughs> That's a good sign. Uh, and I will proceed to the first slide. There we go. So this is a uh, retrospective in, in a sense of 2020 and park operations. Uh, past is prologue, uh, and particularly in this case, because a lot of the same issues that dominated 2020 will dominate 2021, at least uh, for, for some period of time. And that is figuring out how to operate parks and trails and the various programs we, we engage in uh, in the period of COVID. Uh, this is all about a year that COVID dominated, uh, that um, uh, fire, uh, the worst fire season in history dominated. Uh, we were impacted by social justice uh, impacts of the, uh, of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, George Floyd, uh, because we are a policing agency uh, and we were impacted by uh, a sudden onrush of tremendous volumes of people wanting access and, and use of our parts. Uh, and that was all very challenging in those first few weeks. Uh, the first guidance that came out from the uh, health officials of Contra Costa and Alameda <clears throat> was essentially uh, Deer Park Board please keep the parks open, they're, they're essential. Uh, we know there are um, congregations of people happening, we gotta try to discourage that. There, uh, there are people behaving uh, without social distancing as they should, and we, we need to police that and we need to work on it. But by all means, keep yourselves open. It's a very, very crucial uh, mental health uh, uh, issue for our communities when everything else is shut down uh, and, and access to the parks represents a very healthy uh, uh, and, and safe activity for the most part for our populations. So in, in proceeding in this um, COVID emergency re response mode in the first several weeks, uh, it was, a, 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 and I remember this very intense period of time because of the combination of the, um, the, the need to keep the parks open and to um, provide this service to our communities. And at the same time, uh, witness overwhelming crowds <laughs> crowding into these parks. Um, there's a tension there between, uh, between needs and, and safety. And uh, frankly, within the organization, there was a lot of tension. You know, should we just be closing down to avoid this? Uh, these volumes in congregations or, 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 or in, you know, protect our workforce, which was our number one priority was protecting the workforce and our, our park users. Uh, and, you know, we shut down. I'm very proud of this. We shut down just for one day after the stay, uh, shelter in place order hit. Um, but for the most of the, thereafter, we remained uh, open with some exceptions, a couple of the parts like Ardenwood and uh, portions of parts like the Tilden Little Farm uh, had, to, had to remain closed because by their nature, they were congregation areas. Um, and we had to react to the crowds by shutting down some parking lots to discourage uh, outsiders coming over. We were getting a lot of out, you know, people who don't live near our parks were coming to our parks. So we shut down parking lots and that was extraordinarily inconvenient, but it allowed us to maintain some, uh, some restraint on volume 
and also allowed us to prevent the people who were just going to go and, and, and do their picnics and barbecues uh, if they could park near the, near the picnic tables. So all in all, we did that. It was inconvenient. We closed bathrooms for, for uh, several weeks because, frankly, we didn't have the equipment. We didn't know how to, 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 to clean them safely. And we had to really work on those kind of issues. So we were entirely re-engineering the uh, operation of, of parks and trails. Uh, community engagement was immediately uh, a, a pressing need. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people uh, visiting the parks who weren't regular park users. Frankly, there was nothing else to do, right? For some period of weeks, we were trapped at home, but it was encouraged to get out and go and walk in a park and take a hike and just uh, uh, get out in the air. And uh, community engagement became an important facet of what we were doing. We were um, spending a lot of resources on educational efforts, on simple things as signage, uh, where, wherever people access the parks. Uh, a lot of online uh, uh, activity to try to keep uh, keep people informed of what is proper etiquette and uh, and how to say stay safe in the park uh, during the COVID crisis. We did a survey uh, several weeks ago. Actually, this is fairly uh, fairly recent, and we asked people. Now more than ever, parks and trails must remain open and accessible so people have the opportunity to be outside and get physical exercise. 96% agreement and 96% agreement of those we surveyed, including a large portion of people surveyed who did not use our parks, um, agree. So there's, there's, there's widespread and uh, almost universal agreement that it was important to keep these parks open. And despite all that, there's some significant achievements last, uh, last year. Um, most notably, I think, is the uh, uh, opening ribbon cutting, as you see down here, of the uh, Judge John Sutter Regional Shoreline Park. It will eventually encompass all this old army base land that I'm outlining with my cursor. Um, when that's cleared for incorporation into the park, uh, a kayak launch over um, on the uh, harbor side and uh, some improvements in this area too. Um, the, the featured uh, a facet of this brand new park is a pier constructed out of the um, base of the Old Bay Bridge, um, parts of which were going to be blown up until the uh, state agencies involved in that decided that, you know, actually it'd be cheaper to keep these piers and build a, a, a fishing pier uh, and uh, allow people access out there. So that was all done by the state and uh, millions of dollars spent on it. And then, oh, by the way, we'll just give that over to the park district so they can operate this as a, as a park. So that's a, a, an exciting new development down there. Oh, and in uh, terms of my own area, uh, Bay Point, we uh, spent several million dollars restoring a marsh in the Bay Point Shoreline Park in, uh, in Bay Point, next to Pitts Pittsburgh. And uh, we opened that up, a lot of park enhancements there. Uh, the uh, Albany Beach, the Bay Trail gap was filled. This is uh, an amazing, a construction feature. Uh, and uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage everyone to go down and look at it. It, it extends the Bay Trail from the soccer fields on Gilman uh, all the way down to the beach, the Albany Beach. Uh, and we had to circumvent the racetrack because they weren't exactly friendly to our doing this, uh, which means, you know, you look at a bluff and wonder, how, is, how, how are you going to put a trail through there? Well, you're going to spend a lot of money and put it on partially on piers, partially on backfilled uh, slope. And that's what it is, but the views there are absolutely stunning. Uh, we uh, are 
well into the process of developing the Concord Hills new regional park that will inhabit the lands previously uh, devoted to the Concord Naval Weapons Station. It's going to be a 2,500 acre new regional park. The uh, land transfers from the federal government have basically occurred and we are now um, uh, starting to actually uh, make improvements to the land to provide for future access uh, to this to this new park. Oh, we added um, a bunch of new acres for a total of uh, 378 for uh, this past year. And we secured purchase options and other agreements to acquire an additional 626 acres of future parklands. I'll, um, I'll address some acquisitions going on in uh, Martinez and the uh, Highway 4 corridor a little later. The um, completion of 13 park and trail projects this past year, totaling $41 million in projects took place. The, um, the McCosker Creek restoration, there's a little video playing of that work going on. That is maybe at this point halfway complete. McCosker is the largest creek restoration project undertaken in Northern California history. This is a large ranch where a creek had been totally culverted and we are digging it all out and restoring the natural creek. Uh, it's, a, it's a $10 million project and uh, it, uh, it's something we'll all be very proud of. Over by Sibley and uh, the Caldecott Tunnel. Exactly. And I'll, I'll race through this one a, a bit. There's been uh, a lot of uh, advance and, and, and uh, progress made in simple infrastructure improvements in terms of our trails and making sure they're well paid, um, bringing in um, youth, employed youth by the, the state in the CCC Corps uh, to, to do a, a lot of trails work and fire mitigation management. Um, a rare fruit grove at per, fruit grove pergola, a pergola at Quarry Lakes. If anyone knows what a pergola is, please let me know because I, I haven't figured that out. <laughs> the uh, uh, a, a lot of infrastructure advancement was made last year. Uh, we've uh, been working on environmental management issues uh, of, of the list on this slide. The one that has struck me as, mo as, as very impactful is the formalized EBRPD trail users working group, uh, especially in time of COVID, uh, a lot of people are using the trails. And as a result, there's a lot more conflict. So we have the conflict between or among hikers, uh, uh, bicyclists and uh, dog runners and dog, dogs on leash, dogs off of leash and equestrians. And uh, this group uh, has representatives of all those groups trying to work out how we can have multi-use trails that accommodate as many different uses as possible. And it's a really tricky question. And you know, since I've turned what age I'm at and have a bit of sciatica, uh, at my point, hiking narrow dirt trails, uh, bikes are an issue for me, and they weren't 20 years ago. Uh, and we have an awful lot of bikers, for instance, who want to use narrow dirt trails that weren't designed for bicycling. And I think ultimately we're just going to have to design more of those uh, trails for bicyclists uh, and that there is some, some incompatibility there. Uh, but that, that's an important group that is uh, underway right now. And I mentioned we had the worst fire season in history and uh, our parks were impacted down where I'm circling with my cursor, that would be Morgan Territory and Round, Round, Round Valley. We have an actual list of them. So th there was in August something like 12,000 lightning strikes 
throughout the state that uh, sparked all these fires. Five of them occurred in our parks, uh, Del Val, Morgan Territory, Brown Valley, Sonol, and Ohlone. I think all in all, it was somewhere between 4,000 and 5,000 acres. So a lot of acres uh, were burned in, in these parks and they forced their closures for some period of time. And uh, subsequently we've reopened them all and uh, are continuing efforts to uh, restore them as best we can. Uh, record number of park closures. So we've never had a time in the past in the history of the park district where we've had to close parks due to fire threat. One full week in August of all the inland parks because of the severe uh, winds and combination of, of drought and dry vegetation. Uh, so we closed all those parks for about a week, which is unprecedented. And in October, up in the uh, Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond Hills, we closed those parks because of the, the wind danger. There were high winds and again, dry conditions for lack of rain. So for a couple of days, uh, had, had to uh, shut down those parks for safety purposes. Um, you know, and, and one of the problems we had in keeping them open is all our N95 uh, masks were being used for COVID protection by our staff. Uh, and we didn't have extras for uh, protection against this, just the sheer level of smokes, smoke in the parts. I've uh, done a lot of fuels management. This uh, agency spends $3 million a year now just um, creating fire breaks and weed control, brush control. Uh, the only other uh, government unit that spends anywhere near what we spend in the Bay Area is CAL FIRE. So it's a very high priority and lots of effort being continually addressed. Our, our helicopter made something like 200, one of our helicopters made two, 220 bucket drops last year fighting all, all these collective fires. Um, our, our herding, you know, goat, goats, sheep, and um, cattle are an important part of the fuels management program. Uh, our police have been working overtime constantly because of the new volumes. Uh, but a lot of effort in keeping staffs safe. Again, it's been the number one priority. Uh, a lot of healthy, uh, healthy people programs, healthy parts, healthy people programs have been pursued this year. And it uh, has resulted in a whole bunch of social media uh, programs on uh, health and fitness in the parks that have been very successful. Uh, th this is, is remarkable in response uh, to the shelter in place orders. We have 35 naturalists who are very innovative and uh, thoughtful people <laughs> who now couldn't exercise their outdoor programs. And so they moved indoor and digital. And uh, this is a true number through the website as of uh, recently. And uh, website and all, you know, Facebook, Instagram, all the social media uh, activities, posts, uh, and, and uh, programs, the, there are 2,000 pre-recorded programs by our uh, interpretive staff and 344,000 views. Uh, the Park District has basically become a major uh, publication agency, media publication agency, as out of necessity for all of uh, the, the need to keep in uh, contact with our communities. A lot of youth engagement programs. And I've talked about social media out outreach on all sorts of levels. Our foundation has been busy uh, continuing to raise money and have helped fund a number of projects throughout the uh, park district, including the uh, brand new Black Diamond Mines coal mining exhibit, where we basically converted an existing spur mine shaft of the uh, uh, Hazel Atlas mine in uh, in Black Diamond into uh, converted it into a simulated uh, coal mine, and uh, we're just you know sitting around 
being um, very patient in wanting to open it up. Uh, governance, uh, we've you know converted like most agencies to doing Zoom meetings and uh, uh, spending a significant number, a significant amount of money on our uh, uh, via creation of vehicles for public access to our meetings and to the work we're doing and, uh, uh, and continue to do the district's business. We are going to have a meeting, I believe next Tuesday, in which uh, uh, the uh, parent uh, selection of a uh, candidate uh, for our new general manager is going to be made. And I, I can touch on that later if people are interested. A um, lot of workforce uh, activities that uh, hope to make progress in areas of, of uh, uh, harassment and bias training and, uh, and uh, working in the COVID environment. Um, we're doing fine fiscally. We're going to probably lose uh, around $7 million as a result of fees that we're not receiving uh, during the COVID period. You know, marriages aren't being held in our parks and uh, there's other income losses that are associated with the various concessions and other uh, uses that generate user fees. And of course, um, additional expenses of re-engineering the operation of parks to operate safely for our work workforce and our users. Uh, Measure WW uh, generated uh, approximately uh, half, uh, 500 million, yeah, half a billion dollars in, uh, in uh, funding for new uh, capital acquisitions, meaning land or facilities or the building of facilities. It passed in 2008 and we had a local participation uh, portion of the measure WW funding that was allocated to Martinez. It totaled $1,651,000. Martinez has since completed its projects, including waterfront uh, renovation, uh, uh, waterfront park renovation, and uh, part of the West Hill Farm acquisition was made out of WW and we should have added here Almond Ranch, the recent acquisition um, uh, adjacent to Mount Wanda National Park lands was acquired in part with Measure WW funding. Uh, one of the priority projects coming next uh, this year is to uh, focus on planning and implementation of the um, extension of the Iron Horse Trail, finally, uh, from Concord toward Martinez and the Venetia Bridge. We've actually budgeted now for uh, at least the next five years, significant expenditures on both planning and actual implementation of bringing the trail where it ends. I think from this picture where my cursor is, is where the trail ends next to the airport, Cannon Field. And uh, this bridge is being rebuilt by the county and we're contributing in order to create a bike lane and pedestrian lane. And then it'll, the trail will, um, uh, the Iron Horse will start coming down alongside Walnut Creek uh, toward uh, the uh, Martinez uh, uh, refinery areas and, and closed uh, landfills and Waterbird. So that's a very long-term project, but uh, we've managed to actually get it going and it's, it's in the works. Um, I, I, I know Seth is concerned about the Nedgeley staging area to Radke Shoreline Trail. I asked uh, our trails are what its status is and it's all planned, it's ready to go. We're um, looking for approvals from the railroad for the crossing at Baralesa and uh, so for some funding sources that we still have to work at. So that's still, I, I thought that project was gonna be underway a couple of years ago and it's still um, stalled. It's uh, difficult to, to get, get um, trails done that are close to railroads. That's what I've learned in my four years on this board of directors. Um, I'll jump through this. I wanna to get to Martinez. Um, and uh, answer questions about Martinez, but I, I wanted to uh, note 
because I can't but help to, uh, the transition we're going through from uh, Bob Doyle after his 47 year career uh, with, with the Park District, uh, retiring effective at the beginning of this year. Uh, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm, I could go through all of his accomplishments. We could spend tons of time on his accomplishments. I feel his um, not being here uh, acutely because everything we do in the park district, every decision we make, every approach we take, uh, as Bob used to tell me all the time, there's a history to that. And uh, he is um, he is very much a part of the history. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm missing that, uh, that, that history as we move forward. Um, so we, we owe a lot to him. That's a, a tough thing to go through uh, for, for me in particular. Um, we are uh, hiring a, a, a person to replace Bob next Tuesday. And I say apparently because it doesn't happen until we actually vote. Uh, her name is Sabrina Landreth. And Sabrina was the former city manager until fairly recently of the city of Oakland. Uh, and someone who has immense talent, talent and skills and background in uh, the uh, administration of public agencies. And so I'm, um, uh, I'm hopeful that she can um, come into a park agency and have the success she's had with Oakland uh, during the five years that she, she was there. Oh, lots of awards that the park district has assumed. And I want, that's it. I, so I wanna end with a, a couple of notes about um, Martinez and beyond what I've, what I've noted so far. And that is um, that I am uh, really excited about some land acquisitions that are coming. We have to be sensitive to uh, the confidentiality of real estate negotiations. So staff is always you know, threatening um, upon your life if you give away any of this information or talk about our land acquisitions. So I have to be careful of it, but I just learned this afternoon that this is one huge ac acquisition that's been in play for a bit of time that I can actually tell you folks about. And it's the first time that anyone's mentioned uh, the actual ac acquisition of this land uh, publicly. We've been talking about it privately for quite a while, but it's um, 538 acres. It's a huge piece of property uh, at Christie Road. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, a Richfield property. The um, acres are, we, we all of us have seen this land over and over again as you drive up and down Highway 4. As you go under the, uh, the, uh, the railroad overpass, just past the Franklin Canyon golf course, and start up the hill, you look to your right, there's hills and meadows. That's the land, that's the 538 acres. Um, there's a little road that goes off of Highway 4 called Berry Hill. And uh, Berry Hill kind of uh, uh, comes back up toward Cummings Skyway. But essentially, very, it's approximate, but the land between uh, the railroad underpass and the uh, Cummings Skyway to the south of Highway 4 is the 538 acres we're acquiring. And I can tell you today, because I was just informed, it's now an escrow. Um, this is right across from Fernandez Ranch. Uh, as you drive down Christie Road to the entrance of Fernandez Ranch, you will, um, I'm so glad Seth is left. As you drive down toward the entrance, this land is the entire, um, as you drive toward the uh, staging area for Fernandez Ranch, this land is the entire left-hand side as you're looking at land past you across from the railroad tracks. Uh, the key significance of it is connectivity because it will provide immediate trails between Fernandez Ranch and therefore because of Almond and the connection um, that Almond has to it, you, you're going to have connectivity between uh, Fernandez through Cummings Skyway to Crockett. And uh, that is going to be part of the Bay Area Ridge Trail right there, a big gap in the system trail. Um, there are a number of other properties I can vaguely refer to between Brioni's and, and the Highway 4 corridor uh, between uh, Martinez and Hercules. 
that are um, to be acquired if we can acquire them that are certainly, you know, in, in discussions now or in negotiations now, significant uh, acres uh, within that Highway 4 corridor between Martinez and Hercules and uh, in and around the Briones Park. Uh, so uh, that, that uh, hopefully will uh, happen this year. So more significant acquisition, acquisitions beyond that uh, Christie Road acquisition. So Seth, I'll stop there and um, open it up. I went too long, I apologize. You did great and you, uh, and you, you uh, ended it with some really great news about almost a square mile next to coming, coming Skyway. Yeah. Uh, Colin, Colin is working on sewing up Thousand Friends endorsement. I wanted to say just one thing and then open it up for a couple of questions, which is because of people like Congressman George Miller, because of people like uh, East Bay Parks Director Ted Radke, um, who was on the board for over 30 years, um, and because of people uh, like Tim and Kay and others who've been relentless for 30 or 40 years in asking those elected officials, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? For years, Friends of the Franklin Hills did that. They made sure that, that Martinez voted in huge numbers for Measure AA in 1988. Um, they reminded Ted Radke of what needed to happen next and, and which property needed to happen next. And we're in the lucky position of being crossed by multiple regional trails and to have regional parks at every side of the town of Martinez. North, south, east, west, we have regional parks. I don't know very many other um, cities um, that have that. Concord just got its first regional park. But uh, our whole point in asking Colin to do this kind of update and having frequent conversations with the park district is to continue that legacy and continue buying those special and important properties, whether it's the Brickyard or um, Cummings Skyway or, or so on. And so um, it, Colin knows that every time I talk to him, I have questions about what about this? When is this gonna happen? And uh, uh, by having uh, district directors who really are connected to the community plugged in with the projects that are happening and an ally in the East Bay Regional Park District, which is unparalleled, um, we've made incredible progress uh, in conservation in the Martinez area. So um, Colin, we really appreciate you coming to speak to us and to update us. Um, uh, we can't uh, easily um, mute and unmute people. Uh, uh, so if you have a question, just raise your, ra turn on your video, raise your hand um, and uh, unmute yourself and, and we'll see how this goes. Actually, I think I set this up so you may be able to unmute yourself. So as long as it doesn't go out of control, uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. So if you have a question, unmute yourself and pose the question. And if not, I'll have a few questions. Uh, I, I've got one to start, though. Um, had the Iron Horse Trail at the uh, northern terminus right now is down by the Dodge dealership. Uh, next to the airport, yeah, there's there's not any parking down there really right now. There there was a uh, an area where they, you were allowed to park next to the dealership, but they've they blocked that off now. So that if you want to start the trail from there, there's there's no place to go. Uh, you got to park way far away. Um, is there any uh, plans to add some additional parking on the um, the north side of the Iron Horse Trail? Are you talking, Mark, about the where it, where it just dead ends now? Yeah, where it dead ends. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the Marsh Road. Yeah, that's right at the, where this new bridge is being built by the county. Yeah. Uh, so that there, will have to there, take the trail little... off the other side of Walnut Creek. But no, I haven't seen any plans for parking. It sure would be nice to have something down there so, so we can get access to it. Who else had a question? Tim. Uh, Colin, that was absolutely wonderful news about uh, the uh, land out of Christie Road. I love that. Um, the uh, Hewlett Hornbeck was one of the founding members of the Alhambra Hills Open Space Committee in Martinez. And uh, he actually, uh, his family has said that they would be pr proud were that to ever be acquired as public land for a trail up there to be named after him, which couldn't be any more appropriate, especially with his urban trails background. Um, 
Can you tell us anything about um, interest? You know, John Muir owned the land there. It's the only land that he ever owned in his own name is on that hill, those hills. And it actually connects Mount Wanda to Brioni's and, and to the east, it connects via open space all the way to the Contra Costa Canal Trail and, and the lands beyond. So I just thought I'd ask that question just to see if it's, if it's in your galaxy at this point or, or not. Tim, describe the land you're talking about again. It's called the Alhambra Hills. Oh. If you're, yeah, the Alhambra, uh, and, and the group was the Alhambra Hills Open Space Committee. So the, the, and and we're, talking, we're talking, I'm we're sorry, talking. Colin, if you're too much on the spot on a project that you don't know about and you get an answer back to us, uh, we'll put that in one of our next e-blasts as well. No, yeah, I'll, and that's I'll, fine, Colin. I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just asking if, if in case there is. Well, I just tell you what I know. I know that the the, the project is viewed as a city of Martinez uh, potential acquisition to preserve the, the land, uh, and that Martinez is actively working on that. Our participation uh, in that land eventually, be it city of Martinez or uh, or, or the developer, frankly, uh, would be to uh, get a trail that connected through there, through that. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are preliminary plans and an understanding of how we would connect up uh, a trail between gotcha. Bri Brioni's uh, and toward Mount Wanda. So great. That does exist. Good. Thank you. Appreciate Anybody it. Anybody else have a question? Peggy, unmute yourself. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Colin, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I am a hiker and I enjoy all of the parks in the Martinez area. I'm five minutes from Brioni's and it's one that I'm at um, several times a week. And I'm really happy to hear about the trail user working group. Um, the uh, population in Brioni's has increased considerably in the past year. And um, I don't have anything against the bicyclist, but it definitely is having an impact on the trails. And so I'm just wanted to let you know, I'm really happy to hear that that's um, been taken into consideration and that there's a group talking about that. Yeah, it, it's, it's a fairly intense study that we're undertaking with the actual users, representatives at, at the core of, of the group. Great, great. Anybody else with a question? Tasha Hi. has raised her hand. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Tasha. Um, first, I just wanna say thank you so much for the presentation. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate all the work that's been done over this past year um, to keep the parks accessible. I definitely uh, resonate and uh, agree with much of the sentiment you've received that the parks have been such a valuable um, place for us to be during this time. Um, uh, in the advertisement for this, um, for the, for the meeting, it mentioned, um, an update about Pine Meadows. Is that, did I miss it? Or was there something that is happening there? No, that's still to come. We're going to have, okay, we're going to have, we're going to have three quick, uh, updates, um, after we finish the questions in just a couple minutes. Any other questions to Colin? Hearing none, um, Colin, would you just remind me um, one of the figures that I keep being uh, uh, astounded by in addition to the 92 to 96% support for the district, there is no other agency in the East Bay, I think, that reaches that level of public support. Um, and we all, we all know our local parks and trails. But you didn't mention the figure about the increase in visitorship um, in, the, in the last period. And I've found that to be fairly astounding. Yeah, overall, it is estimated to be during, this is since uh, uh, shelter in place orders. Uh, the overall district uh, increased volume in the parks and the trails is around 30%. Uh, but remember, it's, it, you know, the, the, the volumes have differed among the parks. So that's the average. Uh, there are parks, uh, the, and you, you all know them, the most popular parks are seeing increased volumes of around 50%. Jeez. Um, you know, I've been telling people that uh, Waterbird is a really nice uh, hike <laughs> around there. And uh, 
some incredible views of industrial Contra Costa, agricultural Contra Costa, um, and uh, you know, get, get out and try Waterberg. And I've learned recently that Waterberg is being heavily used these days. Um, and you know, I used to go out to Waterberg, and there'd be no one there. Right. Nice. So that's 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 what's happening. Um, and it's it's been hard hard to manage. And uh, I, 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 you know, you you might have your own observations. But I am heartened by the fact that um, there there was some action. You know, I have to characterize bad behavior, bad etiquette uh, among a lot of the new park users uh, in the immediate uh, aftermath of the shelter-in-place order. Um, there were people who just, just did not behave well, um, and over time, and the amount of effort we have put into, you know, our graphics department is working overtime generating. Um, signs constantly just to try to educate people at the parks. We've uh, had a lot of public service announcements on uh, on TV that you folks have probably seen. It's mostly uh, been, been produced by our park district in association with others in the area. Um, Doug McConnell's been on TV all, all the time trying to educate people about using the parks, how to stay safe, socially distance, use masks. I just, you know, I've been out with my wife a couple of uh, times over the past few weekends. And there's a market difference uh, from a month or two ago in mask wearing that people are, the vast majority of people now are wearing masks or at least know to put them on when you pass someone else. Uh, and uh, that's really heartening. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that it's working. I, I really am. Colin, thank you very much for uh, coming to speak to us. Yes, and as I said, um, we send out um, these, uh, these meeting recordings to thousands of Martinez area residents. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, got one more question though. I'm uh -oh. sorry, who's that? Linda. Yeah, this, this, is, this is Mark. Um, hey, uh, Colin, I'm involved with a group, um, Two Day Town down, uh, puts on a, a big show down in uh, Del Val every few years. And yeah, I'm aware of them. I heard a lot about it when uh, we made it difficult to keep it going. Yeah, hopefully um, uh, that's a very valuable thing and it's a very yeah. ecologically oriented organization. Hopefully you'll give them support uh, in the coming years when they are able to do this again. Yeah, I've heard back from some of the leadership, uh, Mr. McPeak, for instance, the, who <laughs> is, is very active with that group. Uh, and uh, we talk, I've heard that it's it's working now, and that our we, we did ask our senior management to give a lot of attention to helping that group out. There were very real, very real and substantial uh, safety issues uh, due to its growth, and uh, we just had to had to uh, compel them to to add add some. Uh, safety measures to so I think we're getting, a little, oh, into, getting a little into the weeds now. Mark, did you have anything else? <clears throat> no. Okay, so Linda Oliveira is going to be the last question. Okay. Um, I'm kind of new to Contra Costa, Colin. Where is Waterbird? Oh, <laughs> you didn't say where it was. Maybe everybody knows, but, but I don't on the know. other side of 680, where, where the shell refinery is. Oh, okay. You and, see it when you're heading toward the bridge. Okay. Is that large lake there. The, the, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Waterbird. Uh, okay. Okay. And the other, real quick, fifty percent of visitors. Where are you getting the fifty percent visitors? Curious. Where do they come from? No, 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 no. What? What? Uh, parks? Is it Redwood Park in Oakland or? Oh, that's what I said. Just name. Think of the most popular parks, and you know Redwood, Tilden, uh, uh, almost all the shoreline parks. Uh, I was out at Point Pinole the other day and I had to park up near the jail. I mean, the parking, both parking lots were full. Oh my God, it's, okay. Uh, th those parks, uh, Black Diamond, uh, Contra Loma, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And Seth, when you accuse me of getting into the weeds, that's, <laughs> what, that's a huge issue for us. That's what we do. <laughs> we spend a tremendous amount of time in the weeds. And Three million dollars as I understand. Yeah, so you know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for all your work. Um, uh, thanks for making the presentation tonight, Colin. Um, and we're going to move thanks, on. We, we've got three quick updates. Um, Kim Platt is going to talk about uh, the Martinez general plan. 
Um, Dan Barrows is going to talk about um, uh, the uh, current update on the redistricting effort. Um, and then Tim is going to do an even quicker update um, about Pine Meadow, which has been in the news a fair bit. Um, so, um, Tim, uh, you wanted me to put up the um, the first. I, right. um, I need to be host, Mark. Um, so I'm going to start talking and you fool around with that, Seth, OK? Yeah. So uh, tonight I'm to talk to you about the general plan update, the GPU, uh, that we believe will be coming before the city council very soon for approval to replace our current general plan. Uh, this GPU is probably the most boring topic I've been asked to talk about in the last 10 years, and I want to apologize up front to you. Unfortunately, it becomes anything but boring when the next high density apartment project is put in your single family neighborhood, or the four, five, six story building is put in in the middle of downtown, or the marina gets slated for a small hotel. The GPU is actually the most important single document the council passes. It will control development and changes in our town for the next 20 to 30 years. And we believe the GPU is a real mess. It's 400 plus pages long. It's very confusing. It's wishy-washy and doesn't protect us. There's lots of the use of the word should and very few instances of the use will, rules, protections that are actual. It's been dormant for five years. And the last input by the, by the public task force is even older, nine years older. Issues like climate change, sea level rise, firestorms, social fairness, weren't even on the radar then. So they haven't been publicly, ad publicly addressed in the plan and also job creation and homelessness are left out. Recommendations to decrease open space and to put high density housing on the waterfront may or may not be included, but they are on the table. And very probably only a few of the city understand the plan at all, since it has been put together primarily by a changing series of consultants and employees who are no longer with the city. That's, uh, it's the other one, Seth, if you would. Okay. Uh, just leave the other one up if you would, because that's what uh, it would be good for people to read. So our first recommendation to the council is that the entire process should be started over again and done the right way. But because the council has put 12 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars on this plan, the council is probably going to try to pass this with minimum study and public input. If they are not willing to restart the process, that leads us to our second recommendation. They at least have the responsibility to clearly and simply make this confusing document understandable to the Martinez public and Martinez public who will be most affected by it. So our second recommendation is that the council give us a good, clear, simple explanation of how this GPU will affect us in our neighborhoods, in our downtown, our marina, and throughout Martinez. What kind of development will it allow and where? What kind of density and height? How will it affect traffic and schools in our neighborhoods? How will it affect the historic town, small town nature of downtown? and the well-being and preservation of our parks and our open spaces and our marina. Also, the council must clearly lay out for us how this general plan update compares with the current general plan that has been modernized continually over the last 30 years. That plan has served us pretty well and has given us citizens protections that have helped our town grow in a good way. What from the current general plan has been kept in the general plan update and what has been left out of the general plan update and what has been added to the GPU. And most importantly, why have these changes been made? It's not up to us to become experts on this 400 page document. It is up to us to make sure that the city council does its job and provides us with the information necessary for us to make judgments 
on whether this GPU should become city law. So we're asking you to please email your city council tonight or tomorrow and tell them that you're not an expert and you shouldn't have to be, but that you believe they must start this entire GPU process over again. And failing that, it is their responsibility to explain this plan to us clearly and simply and compare it to our current general plan. And then they must give us a clear opportunity to tell them whether or not they are moving in the right direction with this critical document. The letters and analysis that we've sent to the city council asking this on our webs are on our website for you to look at and use for reference. That website is www.thousandfriendsofmartinez.org. So we ask that you please tonight or tomorrow contact your council. We've given you information uh, that you're looking at now about what to try to ask them. And if we work together on this, we can make a difference and get them to reopen this plan for us to have true input based upon good information from them. Thanks. Is that it for the general plan update? Um, That's thing? it. That's it. Does anybody have a question about the general plan update? Unmute yourself if you do. Peggy. Is there a timeline, Tim, for the council to approve the update? Uh, the, there isn't. Um, the uh, draft uh, GPU was finished about five years ago, as was the draft EIR, and it has been sitting unattended uh, and out of public view ever since then. Uh, in the last year and a half, it, about a year and a half ago, it was taken off the website. And if you're real <laughs> sneaky, you can maybe find parts of it on the website now. But if you are just a regular person looking under planning and looking at documents, it's not there at all. It says, and, and we don't know what is on the website if there is something, because we don't know what's changed in the last five years. Um, we don't know for sure what they're doing with the plan and we don't know what status it's going to come back in. So this is all reasons for us to say, city council, you really need to step back about four steps in this process and start over again. And you need to bring us into the process and let us know what's really going on and how we can have input into it. There's also some deliverable dates on some of the contracts with the consultants, uh, but they haven't been met yet. And so um, we know that one of the council members is going to be asking for an update. They moved the council meeting to our seasonal uh, meeting uh, date right now, or some of the, some of the uh, um, uh, city council people might be at this meeting. Uh, but I, I understand that's coming up tonight asking for an update. Any other questions about general plan? Okay, Dan Barrows uh, is going to give us a, a quick update on redistricting, and Dan, you're looking great. Okay, hi. Yeah, sorry, this camera is really bad, but uh, thank you. Um, super quick, uh, we have been uh, working with another group that I'm involved with, the Martinez Citizens for Responsible Government, and uh, focused on having this city adopt an ordinance establishing an independent redistricting commission to the city of Martinez, which you're freezing for me, Dan, sorry. Back in 2017-18. Can you hear me? No. Not very well, no. Have to stop um, over. Okay, well, why don't move on to the next person and I'll, and I'll go last. Okay, we'll let me come switch back to you. devices. Um, Tim is going to do a, a quick, uh, even quicker update on um, Pine Meadow, which has been in the news. Um, Tim, and throw up that map, if you would, uh, uh, Seth, absolutely. Uh, if you can. So the yes. agreement on Pine Meadow uh, was signed back in July of 2019. Um, and I have to say that all of the parties, especially the city, moved very rapidly to, to do the steps that were specified in the agreement. And about, in my estimate, about 70% of the steps in the agreement were done uh, by September of that year. 
uh, which uh, is quite an accomplishment. Uh, unfortunately, that's the time period at which um, Denova and the city started uh, seeing they had issues over drainage and some other um, building issues with regard to the project. Uh, those issues were discussed and wrestled uh, over between the two parties throughout 2020 uh, and with no resolution. Uh, in the latter part of 2020, DeNova filed suit against the city, uh, claiming that they were not abiding by their uh, requirements in the uh, agreement. And that lawsuit is the lawsuit that recently was in the papers uh, talking about a, a $35 million judgment uh, uh, potential against the city. It's, it's that lawsuit uh, that was started uh, back in November. Um, the negotiations have continued and they are actively going on right now. Uh, and the goal is that They'll, come, they'll be able to put a resolution of the outstanding issues together and at the same time settle uh, the lawsuit as well. Um, from our standpoint, uh, we're looking forward to one that satisfies both parties and gets us the open space and parkland that we've been fighting for since 2014. Um, there's not been a new park in Martinez in over 20 years. And this is the last site in Martinez for a decent park. So uh, stay tuned. We're looking forward to getting these issues resolved and starting to dig dirt on the lot. And just reminding people that part of what you may have seen in the news also is that DeNova or uh, by text, et cetera, DeNova has been doing a, a pressure campaign um, trying to get people to text city council members um, to uh, um, go their way in various aspects of this thing. So um, they're, they're ramping up the pressure um, on the city based on these uh, differences about drainage and so on. Um, and uh, you'll, <laughs> there will undoubtedly be more to come in the near future. Anybody have any questions on Pine Meadow? Hearing none, uh, we frequently update in our e-blasts about um, Pine Meadow and there's a lot on the web. Um, uh, but uh, uh, all of this is about the, the current settlement and whether or not uh, the development moves forward in the current uh, rendition or, or has to get renegotiated in some way. Um, Dan, are you back with us? We'll give him about a minute. Anybody have any questions for um, a thousand friends of Martinez about any other issues um, while we're waiting for Dan to come back on? And since we don't see him, the, the, the simplest thing to say about redistricting is that the city council has started meetings about the redistricting process. Um, Thousand Friends of Martinez has uh, recommended that the city use an independent redistricting commission uh, in order to draw new boundaries. Um, and any elected official is probably aware by now um, that the Census Bureau has um, has let it be known that uh, the, the census numbers are gonna be late. Um, they're expected, I think now in, in some time in September, that could be delayed again. Um, but uh, the California Independent Redistricting Commission has already gotten going um, in doing its work to uh, uh, select commissioners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, we're, we're um, encouraging the city to do an independent public process um, rather than re repeat the mistakes they made last time around uh, with what have been recognized uh, as gerrymandered districts. Tim, you had a, a, something to add? Uh, I've just got a message from Dan that he's in the waiting room. And I think he spoke before city council actually today. And I know one of the issues is that uh, the uh, city council in, in many ways has promised to put this on the agenda as an actual discussion item. And, and that doesn't seem to be happening too readily, but I don't know if you can get Dan in the waiting room or not. And he can you, give you some. On. Dan, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I'm back. Thanks, sorry. And I did a very quick update about a couple of aspects, but very brief. So why don't you um, uh, give people the actual update? Okay, sorry. So the deal is with the, uh, 
city council, they ha held a workshop, what is it, about two weeks ago on redistricting. Um, and we've been pushing them to adopt an independent redistricting commission. They're non-committal. There's a lot of uh, uh, lip service to the potential for setting up such a commission, um, but they're they're uh, saying they're waiting for this or waiting for that. A consultant uh, and and tonight or yesterday, I had an email exchange with the mayor who said that the city manager would be giving the council an update on their options tonight. So we're uh, some of our members are over there. Um, again, pushing for the establishment of an independent commission. And while you're sending an email to your city council members about the general plan update, you might also mention uh, that you are in favor of the establishment of an independent commission as opposed to having the city council choosing their own uh, voting boundaries and essentially choosing who gets to vote for them. So that's the basic update. Anybody have questions about redistricting? And back to my uh, question before, um, does anybody have any questions about Thousand Friends of Martinez in general or any Martinez political issues? Then we appreciate your time. Um, we really wanna thank Colin Coffey for um, presenting tonight and telling us the good news uh, about the coming Skyway new property that's in escrow. Um, we'll, we'll write more about that as soon as they give us more information about it. Um, uh, we appreciate the updates from Dan and Tim, um, and we appreciate your time. Um, we'll be back in about three months for another uh, uh, quarterly meeting, um, and uh, look for our e-blast. They're coming out on a monthly basis right now, um, and uh, uh, hopefully you find them informative. Thank you all.